boards and committee meetings as long as I'm not stopped by any of our communication staff. And I think it, we're good. All right. Uh, Commissioner Madden, who's chairman of this committee, is not available to be with us this morning. So Commissioner McCarley and I are the remaining members of that committee. Uh, a, me a meeting of the municipal committee is scheduled today, right now, and it includes the following recommendations. Number one, Civil Service Board recommendation from HR and Civil Service Director Mark Farrington to appoint Nicole Bradham, uh, Brad Bradham as a regular member to fulfill the unexpired term of Beatrice McKee beginning June 19th, 2023 and ending February 20th, 2025. Ms. Bradham will be eligible to serve an additional full three-year term. It's what's your pleasure <clears throat> do you um, we can do them all at once if you want right. number two at them now. planning and zoning or recommendation from chief planner Matt Lyons to appoint Veronica Roundtree as a regular member to a three-year term beginning August 7th 2023 and ending August 6th 2026 and then reappoint Jerry Tom as a regular member to a second three-year term beginning August 17th 2023 and ending August 16th 2026 then there's the third recommendations, which are for the Zoning Board of Adjustment and Appeals, and a recommendation again from Chief Planner Matt Lyons to appoint Judith Hatfield as a regular member to a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2023, and ending June 30th, 2026. And then to appoint Emily Brahaney as an alternate member to a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2023, and ending June 30th, 2026. Um, so is Move for approval of all five appointments. And this is, a, and, and I second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. For information only, the city is accepting applications for the following upcoming vacancies. Interested residents may apply at our website, uh, which ends with municipal boards committees. Uh, when you look online. Affordable Housing Advisory Committee looking for three members, one who is an employer with the, within the jurisdiction, and one that's as an employer, and one who is engaged in the residential home industry, and one citizen who resides in city limits. So three different capacities, one is an employer, one is a residential, engaged in residential home industry, and one citizen who resides within the limits at large. Then for Civil Service Board, looking for one member, must be over the age of 21, a registered voter, and live inside the Lakeland Electric Service Territory. And then the last one is a Committee Redevelopment Area Advisory Board member looking for three members, one who owns property or a business or works in the Dixieland CRA District, and one in the Midtown CRA District, and one in the Downtown CRA District. If you have any questions about that, those are shown also online if you get to our website. We encourage everyone who is wanting to increase their opportunity to participate in the city and their knowledge of it and of the many complexities that it comprises to uh, apply for online the, an opportunity to serve on a committee, and we would love to entertain that possibility when it matches our opportunities. Any other um, items? All right. Seeing none, uh, we are adjourned. We'll wait two minutes and start our agenda study. Good morning, nice. Commissioner Reed. Good morning, Commissioner McLeod.
agenda study. And we'll bring that to order if we can. And we could start right now. Okay. So looking at the agenda, we have presentations that we will have made, uh, social media marketing, uh, past, present, and future, Kevin Cook's going to do for us and give us an update along with Jamin Smith. We have no proclamations for this meeting. And we have uh, committee reports, both the legislative update that will be given, as well as the municipal boards and committee, consent agenda, utility committee, city commission minutes, and, and looking for any other items on the consent, yes, item 98C1, uh, which is a memo regarding the Clean Air Act designated representatives. And we have Ramona Siriani to give us an update on that. Good morning. Um, this is the agreement that you've, the commission has seen in the past and what this agreement does. We have to designate certain individuals uh, at Lakeland Electric to act on behalf of the city in response to reporting for the Clean Air Act. And when those designees change, we have to update that agreement. So the new designees are Miles Dentler and Kevin Robinson. And essentially the agreement um, provides that the city will indemnify these individuals because they have to accept responsibility as long as they're acting within the scope of their employment. So that is the, the only change that you're seeing here are the new designated representatives that the city um, will indemnify. I'm leaving that on consent. Some questions. Yes. I, understand why, I understand why we're doing this, but who has imposed this Clean Air Act on us? Well, this is coming down from federal requirements as well as um, the state of Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the EPA. So those are, those are the requirements and the regulations that we have to abide by in terms of reporting for what the utility. What if we don't? Well, Why would I, we not? Pardon me? Why would we not? <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just asking, is there, what, what kind of penalties do we have there? I'm just wondering. There are substantial monetary penalties as well as uh, revocation of certain licenses that probably operate the, the utility as well. So it's important that we, we comply with those regulations. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Simmons. Those who are doing the report, excuse me, those who are doing the reporting for the Clean Air Act, what exactly are they reporting? I'm going to have, I think, Nedin Botten is, it Batek is here for the LE, and he can give you some specific detail as to what, what they have to do. Right. Thank you for being here, sir. Good morning. Uh, Nedin Batek, uh, Lake Electric Environmental. Uh, there are emissions that we report to EPA on a quarterly basis. There are periodic reports that we submit to EPA and also to the state agency, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So there's a lot of reporting to be done. In, in essence, the reporting is saying that, um, that our, our air is clean. I mean, what's it saying? All well, for oh, emissions are clean? to EPA, we, we have continuous monitors installed on our stacks for our major generating units. So we report those emissions that our monitors collect and record. So that's required under the- So then the emissions then would meet some standard? Is that what you're saying? Right, yeah, we have permit limits and there are some programs under EPA, the, the acid rain program where we have to uh, report how, how many tons of each pollutant we emit each quarter. So yeah, we, we do have limits that we have to comply with. It's how we reflect compliance. Right. Okay, right, 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 all right. Thank you. Hmm? All right, any other questions? All right, is it okay to then to leave that on consent? All right, we will do so. Thank you very much for that and appreciate the report. That brings us to 3A1, uh, ordinances, second reading. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have a couple of ordinances uh, for second reading. Uh, this is recognizing a non-conforming mobile home park uh, in, in North Lakeland uh, with a, a conditional use approval that would allow them to replace uh, uh, units within the mobile home park, even though they might, those particular uh, lots for those units may uh, be vacant for over a 365 day period. So we're, what we're doing here is looking at the mobile home park as a whole. and We're not going to amortize out individual lots within the mobile home park. Only if the mobile home park as a whole uh, is, goes, is discontinued for a period of, uh, of a year would we uh, uh, phase out that nonconforming use. 
Um, there, I should add that, that uh, in the last day or so, we've discovered that there may be a utility conflict associated with this. So we're still looking at that. And so we may be asking for a continuance of this on Monday. Uh, but our utility folks are continuing to look at that. Um, and, and I know Chuck can show you maps of, of where this is. Uh, Do you want to make some comments on that, sir? Oh, sure. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, this, is, this is all, um, this mobile home park is located within the Robson Street enclave area that was annexed um, and the zoning for, and, and land uses for this area were assigned back in 2002. At that time, there was a provision that, that would allow for the replacement of mobile homes on just individual lots for a period of five years. Of course, that doesn't, wasn't applicable in this case, but that provision expired in 2007. And so uh, really essentially what we're, what we're trying to do is allow for the replacement of mobile homes consistent with changes in the land development code that have occurred uh, subsequent, including in 2021, which allowed for the replacement of mobile homes that uh, were up to 25 years old uh, in, in, in these types of situations. Part of that as well, what we were also looking to do uh, through this conditional use was to allow for upgrades to the buffering, um, ensure that the internal road system was continued to be maintained in an acceptable condition. And what I will do is show you a tour of the site here. <clears throat> make sure the dumpster enclosure was brought into compliance and, and, and allow for this mobile home park to uh, become more of a um, conforming development over time. And so you can see generally the state of uh, the units today. Um, really part of this as well, and, and this, this is alludes to one of uh, Palmer's comments, is that we also need to vacate a portion of the Collins Street right-of-way along the north side of the site in fact, what I will do is I'll jump back to that. There's some existing mobile homes that encroach into the Collins Street West right-of-way, as well as the utility easement. So part of this request is also involves the vacation of the, of the utility easement along the north side of this property and the vacation of the Collins Street right-of-way so that those mobile homes uh, would be on the private property and not in public right-of-way. It remain on. Exactly. Carly. It was annexed into 2000. Correct. Okay, that's not my question. <clears throat> Sorry, Andrew. That was my question was when it was annexed into the city. Thanks. Commissioner Reed. Thank you. Chuck, are they going to replace all of these or just one? And if they are going to replace one, is there, have we put an age restriction on what they can put in there or, or have to stuff like that? The age restriction would be no more than 25 years old, and that's compliant with the land development code uh, update that was made back in two, uh, 2021. Um, and, and, and really, it's just if the units become um, inactive or vacant for more than a year, that's where they would be able to, to, to do that. I think once they went after 1973, they can't get insurance on them, something like that. Is, uh, and the 25 year old ones. Yeah. And old, and old, right. So ultimately, they're going to remove those as well, you think? or? It, it just really is, as they're, as, as they're replaced, they would need to be brought in to a, have a more uh, current unit, but as they stand right now, if they're occupied, um, you know, even, even regardless of the age of the unit, they would still continue, you know, as long as, as long as they're safe and, and, and habitable, they would be allowed to continue to stay on. So if they on have a 50, they're going to take out, they got to bring in maybe basically a 2000 model, something like that. One. Roughly. Uh, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chuck. So the utility issue in question is the vacating of the easement or why we would possibly seek a continuance? It, it would involve either the vacation of the easement or the vacation of the Collins Street right-of-way. This is tied to the force main that is uh, uh, being designed right now to connect the Wedgwood Golf Course property across to Lakeland Hills Boulevard. And so the, the corridor that we're looking at here is within that alignment. And so the big question now is, is does the vacation of the right-of-way or the easement create a problem for that force main construction? And so why are utilities looking in, into that in more detail just to make sure that we're that we're not creating an obstacle here. Okay. Thank you. On a process basis, if it created an obstacle, those units would really have to move, wouldn't they? And based on our discussions with water utilities yesterday, they certainly have no intent to build the, you know, have the forest main built underneath those, underneath those units. So there's a, there appears to be an easement. I'm going to jump back to the map here. Uh, just north of the subject property, um, just to the west of Carpenter's Crest, uh, so that it looks like that there may be a utility easement already in place. 
that would allow for the construction of this force main. And so that's part of the additional time that we may be requesting on Mondays for additional research to occur to see exactly what that easement would allow. And are there other, um, is there other infrastructure within that easement that would create another problem for the force main? So there's a lot that we're trying to work on and, and open time. Exactly. And so water utilities just kind of wanted to let us know that it's probably going to take more than a, than a day or so to, to work out those details. That's why all this gets complicated. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? I think that answers ours. And now let's go to item number two. Right. Item, item two is a modification of a conditional use for a preschool at an existing church on Robson Street. Chuck? Again, this is, this is another development site within the Robson Street Enclave area. Uh, the, the request here is to modify the conditional use to allow a preschool with a maximum of 67 students. Um, the site is located directly across the street from North Lake and Elementary on the north side of Robson, just east of Baird Avenue. Um, no, at this point, no construction is expected with this project. Uh, the school would operate within the existing uh, buildings on the site. And so most of our conditions really relate to uh, <clears throat> on-site circulation. And so the exhibit here, uh, and, and really the church is already doing this, is that the, the, the Robson Street uh, driveway would need to be blocked off during pickup and drop-off times. Access would be restricted to Barrett Avenue to minimize any conflicts with North Lakeland uh, Elementary, which is already, the school district's already working with our traffic operations division and has for years on, on, on that um, uh, circulation issue. So um, because with the, with the annexation that occurred back in 2000 with the Enclave, um, a uh, RM uh, land use was established, RA3 uh, zoning was established, and a conditional use for the existing churches within the Enclave area. But those conditional uses did not include specific conditions for specific properties. So the intent of this is to add the, um, uh, the, the preschool as, a, as, as part of the conditional use allow for ages uh, three to five, uh, maximum enrollment of 67 students. We would have a binding site plan, uh, and the development standards uh, would be in accordance with the, uh, the land development code, uh, the RA3 and urban neighborhood standards. Uh, as discussed earlier, the uh, pickup uh, and drop-off circulation would occur off of uh, Baird Avenue, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, traffic would not be allowed to queue back into public right-of-way. Uh, outdoor lighting would be in, a, uh, in accordance with the code. Uh, buffer would exist of a uh, six-foot high fence with 90% view blockage uh, maintained on the internal property uh, adjacent to the single-family residential uses. A lot of that exists today. Um, and then the bike parking uh, would be required in compliance with the code, and that would be primarily for employees. So it may be just one loop. So it's going to be fairly minimal, but it's something that uh, the, the, the employees would be able to take advantage of. Any questions on that? And they're uh, uh, not seeing any obstacles in this from their perspective? We haven't heard any concerns. Uh, there were some <clears throat> questions regarding the bike parking at the Planning and Zoning Board, and so we believe that the conditions as they're structured now would give them flexibility. I think there was concern that the, the uh, students from North Lakeland Elementary would actually use the bike parking on the church property. So um, huh. as, as, as part of any site plan review process, we would work <clears throat> with them to, you know, they've got plenty of room internally to be able to work this out so that it's somewhat hidden. Um, and, and so we're comfortable with the conditions that are, that are written to address those comments. Right. right. Um, item B1. Right. Item B1 is the second reading of a resolution uh, relating to the designation of a brownfield area uh, on property owned by Blue Sky just south of Griffin Road north of Mall Hill Drive. Uh, I think, do you have a map of that, Chuck, that you can put up? The wrong one up. We have 2033 up. We want 23030 up. About 11 and a half acres just south of Griffin Road and, and just a little bit north of Mall Hill Drive. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I believe this is some, has some actual uh, you know, contamination, not just perceived contamination related to uh, some old citrus grove operations there. Uh, so what, what this would do is, is allow the developer of this property, it's Blue Sky, to uh, get a refund of, of uh, sales tax on building, building materials as they develop this property. It's being developed for affordable housing. Similar to what we did on, yes. by um, the Troy Tigers Stadium. <clears throat> Any questions on this one? Next. All right, next is a grant agreement with the FDOT uh, to purchase uh, a new uh, uh, um, 
aircraft uh, rescue and firefighting vehicle at the airport. Uh, the, old, the old one is uh, approaching the end of its life. So this is an agreement with the FDOT where, by which they will, the, the FDOT will give us $45,700. We'll match that. And then the federal, uh, federal funds will, uh, of $822,000 will also be applied to purchase this vehicle. Since on that. Yes, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. What do we do with the old vehicle? Old vehicle trade-in. Chris. Morning. Chris. <laughs> put it on uh, Facebook and sell it. <laughs> Marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're actually going to be keeping it for right now. Um, this process takes a couple years to get a truck. Um, once you order from like Oshkosh or Rosenbauer or one of the other companies that are out there, it, it's looking like a two to four year lead time on the vehicle. So we have two ARF trucks currently, one 16 years old. One was from the 80s and rebuilt in the early 90s. And we're just going to keep them running until we get the new vehicle. And once we get the new vehicle, we'll make decisions on how we need to operate. Two to four year timeline, is that um, different from years past? I mean, is that because of the current state of supply chain? Production, and, yeah. production issues. Um, you know, so we're here in Oshkosh is saying it could be four years once we actually put in the PO. Yep. Gives you a little time to... Tweak your PO, doesn't it? <laughs> have to change it from time to time. Yes. Um, ultimately, what do we typically do with the expired engines? Um, they'll usually go out and, and be sold outright to, or in the auction the city sends to. They're liquidated for whatever the market costs. They're liquidated, yeah. yes. Okay. Commissioner Any Simmons. Any idea what the salvage value would be? Um, probably pretty low. Chief, any thoughts? Williams, um, it really depends on salvage value. We've done that in the past, but I can tell you because of the lead times with production on fire trucks of anywhere from two years to four years with something like this, we're actually keeping and doing some cost saving measures by, by actually keeping those and salvaging those parts um, at, a, at a great value for the city. And we've done that now for about the last 18 to 24 months. But so, prior, prior to that, they would go for, uh, not very much money because we literally strip everything of value that we can use for our current fleet from them. Okay, so you kind of cannibalize the... Uh... We, yes, sir, at our, our, our fire station four at west side, there are two cannibalized fire trucks there, and we, we use parts from them all the time. Thank you. And you so. compare that to market values that are available absolutely, as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Good questions. Anything else on that? Item three. Right, item three is uh, approving the transfer of conditional use for uh, a restaurant at 733 East Palmetto Street. I think you all are all very familiar with the red door and that they've sold. Uh, they've sold uh, the property to Palmetto Hospitality LLC, which is an LLC uh, owned by uh, Ryan Lopez and Wesley Barnett. And Peach House Lakeland LLC will actually operate the restaurant at this location. That, that The manager of that uh, LLC is Ryan Lopez. Uh, they would just simply inherit all the existing approvals and conditions of operation that the the Red Door is currently operating under. And this would also operate as a restaurant as well? It's a restaurant that and, has, and, has right. uh, beer, wine, and, and liquor uh, uh, rights to it, uh, outdoor music, outdoor seating. Uh, you've seen the, the patio there, and I believe right, they right. have some additional outdoor seating. Can read. Do you know, do they have, do they have a four COP? Because... I've been, I didn't think they ever served liquor, per se. I don't, I'm looking over at, at Matt Lyons. They do, they do have a four COP yeah, license. They do. They were permitted in 2013. were permitted in 2013. Mr. Lyons is going to augment our, you can use that mic right there. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to walk back so far. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, and then usually the um, transfer was for beer and wine only. Um, in 2013, it was amended to allow for beer, wine, and liquor. And then in 2016, 2017, um, Richard DeAngelis, that's when he did the, um, the porch edition. That was to, um, I guess, meet the um, DBPR, their seating requirements for the 4COP. Um, so they had used that uh, liquor license for the remaining years of their operation. So that will be part of this here. So is this something different, or is it the same thing they've always had? And I mean, it's always been a restaurant. So it, it's I, I knew that, but I meant as far as the liquor sales. Um, yeah, they've had that since 
they just 2013. don't. We'll have that. I, they just the don't to have that same right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Will be the same as it has been most recently. Anything else? Any other questions? I've got a question. Yes, Commissioner Simmons. In general, with regard to conditional use transfers, is that typically brought before the board? Are there none that are just automatic? With yes, we have. Our land of them code actually specifies that conditional uses are specific to the, the, the owner. And okay. so when there's a change of owner or operator, they have to come back for a resolution before the city commission. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Reed. Thank you. While, while we're on this subject a little bit, um, the place over on McDonald Street, that's kind of the out same, out same thing. What's that called? 850. Pardon me? Do wait 50, patio. Patio. Yeah. Yeah. 50 yeah. minutes switching. Uh, how long does that tent get to stay up there? Don't they have limitations on those tents for being in those? Uh, Mr. Lyons. I'll, I'll look to Mr. Lyons again. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to hang out at the podium for a while, Matt. Um, I believe the tent's supposed to be there for seasonal use. Um, several years back, if you recall, we amended the code to address that very situation there. Um, so I have uh, looked at that probably closely to see if it, they've been complying with that um, but there is a provision in the code to allow for the seasonal use of those type of tents i mean if you recall that that, that business um they had very little indoor seating um it was a very small space there so the bulk of their um business was outdoors and that, that was fine during the winter you know when it was pleasant but you know in summer and the rainy season obviously um that's typically when they would put up the tent there to provide that the cover from the elements. Because oh, I thought they were limited for a certain period of time, and but I, I think that's been up here for years, to my knowledge, as opposed to supposed to come up and come down. But I mean, my my perception is that they only use it during uh, maybe the summer. You know, maybe from um, maybe from May through through to the fall. But I don't recall having been up during the winter when it's certainly pleasant outside. But um, yeah, we can certainly look into that. Thank you. Maybe you could give us an update on that, even if it's by email or something. Thank you. All right, seeing no other items on uh, interest on that item, we'll go to C1. C1 is the is something we have to do on an annual basis, and that's uh, provide a, a, a report and public hearing on the action plan and for the use of funds for the CDBG and home uh, uh, investment funds that we get. Uh, so uh, Mike Spitz here, he'll make a brief presentation on Monday regarding to that, relating, relating to that. This is actually only the first uh, public hearing of two that are required. Second public hearing will come back for you on July 17th, so you won't take any action on, on uh, Monday, but we'll need to at least open it up for public comment. Okay. Do this morning? We'll just save it to Monday. Okay. Um, bring us to City Manager Report 5A. Good morning. Uh, three items this morning for presentation. Uh, the first item is related to a change order with Cobb Site Development. Uh, we are nearing the completion of the project at uh, County Line Road and US 92, and there's a needed uh, change order in the amount of $80,848, and this is believed to be uh, the, the probably the, the final uh, change order needed for this um, project. Uh, the, the change order uh, has been reviewed and reconciled by the city and FDOT. Um, the change order is to uh, provide um, work and, and, and services um, related to some uh, uh, needs uh, to complete the project. Um, it will, uh, first of all, there's some uh, costs associated with um, project delays and redesign. Um, there was a, a gas line uh, in the area and there had to be some work uh, on that. And so um, now uh, uh, following that, we need to remobilize the contractor back out there uh, to complete. Um, there's some additional uh, surveying needs, additional asphalt uh, paving and milling, and then also the uh, maintenance of uh, traffic for an additional 10 days. Uh, this is also then the reconciliation for any project overruns or, or underruns on uh, the, um, the anticipated uh, estimated cost. And then um, there's also a, a minor adjustment uh, related to a previous change order. Uh, it's de minimis. It was $537, uh, dollars, and that was found um, in the process of the reconciliation on the project. So this will bring the total project to contract amount with Cobb to an amount of $1,856,228. Um, this is uh, funded through the Transportation Fund Capital Improvement Plan, and so the request will be to approve of this change order. Any questions on that? None? Next. All right, the next item uh, that we have is uh, related to um, negotiations uh, for professional engineering and consulting uh, 
services uh, with some selected firms. This is related to our solid waste transfer station uh, design and permitting project that we have uh, discussed um, previously. Uh, this is all um, um, in accordance with the um, Competitive uh, uh, Negotiation Act. You often hear us refer to that as CCNA. Um, the city did go through a process of issuing a request for uh, qualifications for those engineering and uh, consulting uh, services. We had three firms that responded. A uh, selection uh, committee evaluated uh, the firm based on a set of uh, specific uh, criteria. Um, the selection committee um, is now requesting to begin contract negotiations with the first rate firm and the rankings of those firms are uh, number one was Geo Syntec out of Tampa, Florida. Number two, HDR Engineering, also out of Tampa. And then third was Jones, Edmonds, and Associates um, out of uh, Gainesville. And so the request will be to approve of um, the negotiations uh, with the first ranked um, firm, which again was Geosyntec. And then should those negotiations fails, we will simply then go down the list uh, negotiating with each one until uh, we are successful. So the, um, the, the, the request will be for just uh, have the commission approve of the negotiations with the firms as ranked. And then those negotiations, just as a point of information, uh, are satisfactory with the first firm and we don't go on and, and they take place. How do we establish good valuation of that acceptance? In other words, uh, how do you know that we there wouldn't have been less expense for the second or third one on that in this process? You really um, don't. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that's part of the discussions. And of course, there's estimations on what the expense will need to be. But we, we will never negotiate the, um, the, the final um, price with uh, the second and third rate firms unless we're unsuccessful with the first. Which is why you rank them in capacity first. Yes, okay. qualifications. That's required by law that you evaluate, evaluate on qualifications only and then you try to negotiate with first, second, third. Good, thank you. And, and that's, you know, that, that's a big difference just to point out between the RFQ and the RFP process. You know, the, the Q is about qualifications where a proposal will uh, include some, you know, cost estimations. Thank you. Probably asked that about five years ago. Okay, never mind. So, <laughs> all right, next in your third item. Okay, um, uh, the final item is a uh, another um, change order uh, with Cobb site uh, development and um, uh, and also a uh, an amendment that is needed with a joint project agreement that the city has with um, Polk County, and this is on the uh, North Wabash Avenue extension um, uh, project. Uh, this is now uh, negotiated warranty work that needs to be done and also the restoration work related to that water main uh, failure and the other uh, issues that resulted from that um, failure. The uh, change order amount is uh, $129,788 and that has been uh, reviewed by city staff and our um, inspection uh, and construction engineering consultant. Um, and these, uh, this change order will apply to um, the water main failure restoration that I mentioned. Uh, the, um, the total cost on that is $189,449. However, that cost will be equally, through the negotiation, it will be equally divided between the city and Cobb Construction. And then in addition to that, Polk County has agreed to reimburse 50% of that, and that's why there's a need to amend the um, JPA that we have with the, um, with the county. There's also some work to be done related to asphalt uh, friction um, on Wabash uh, for the Redding Point development. Uh, the cost of that is $35,063. The uh, developer of... Um, of that development will be reimbursing the city for almost all of that, uh, but it will be specifically in the amount of $33,827 on the reimbursement. So if you do that kind of crazy math, you, you end up with a total change order amount uh, in, in, that's at $129,700 and uh, $88. Um, uh, this amount will be uh, transferred from the recently completed Lakeland Park Drive connector impact fee project, and both projects are in the District 1 impact fee fund within the transportation fund. Um, there's the work to be uh, pro uh, 
provided here uh, will uh, resolve uh, some pavement uh, depression. Uh, there's a, a ditch uh, pavement erosion um, work that needs to be done, a pipe culvert repair, and then there's a void under some asphalt that needs to be resolved. Again, this will also require that amendment um, to the JPA with the county, uh, which will include the reimbursement um, as discussed. And so the request will be to enter into the uh, change order again in the amount of $129,788. If in fact there were an additional change order, order following this, that would have to be separately addressed at that time? Yes. Okay. Just yeah, Commissioner Simmons. Question. Um, that project and the relationship between the county and the city, is, is there a common geographical area that the county and the city uh, in that project that, that, they are, that they're working on? Good morning, Greg James, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, there is a uh, delineation between the county's uh, responsibilities in the city as far as 10th Street and South would be county uh, responsibility. And then north of 10th is going to be city um, responsibility for maintenance and operation going forward. So the work that's being uh, completed, it covers both county and, and city uh, geographically. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Right. When we originally started the project, uh, we had designed it for 10th Street and north. We were going to rebuild the intersection and then extend the road up to Fairbanks. And then the county had already improved uh, Wabash south of Crutchfield all the way down to 92. So it was just gonna leave that short pocket. So the county agreed to go ahead and design um, that section from Crutchfield to 10th Street. And then we included that in our construction bids. And then we've been working together uh, to see it through to completion. Thank you, thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Seeing none, that brings us to Finance Director A. I have a couple of uh, city attorney items yes. before we get there. Oh, I, oh I'm sorry, I missed the whole section. But so we, have, we, we have a couple of uh, <laughs> water, uh, water items and, and one IT item. Uh, Alex is going to present the two water items. Good morning. Uh, Alex Landback for the city attorney's office. The first item is a, a purchase order for construction services with Vortex Services, LLC. This is for a cured in place pipe sewer main annual rehabilitation project. And this is for about 14,407 linear feet of degraded sewer pipe throughout n about nine locations around the city. Vortex will be utilizing a cured in, pl uh, cured in place pipe installation process, which is trenchless and no dig. Uh, the Vortex will access through sewer mains. Uh, you know, I can't explain the science behind it. Uh, but they, they'll access it through uh, sewer mains, uh, and then the purpose of this is to reduce and ideally eliminate cracks that, are, that could allow rainwater or roots to get through. Uh, as I said, there are about nine separate work locations that have been identified by wastewater collections uh, that based off of age or uh, the condition of those particular sewer pipes. Uh, Vortex's proposal was solicited using a buy board cooperative pur purchasing, uh, which is a local government purchasing cooperative. Vortex will perform the scope of work under this attached proposal for a not to exceed cost of $734,975.50, which is included in Water Utilities FY23 budget. This is a unit priced proposal and the actual billing will be based on installed quantities only. The project is expected to be completed on or before September 30th, 2023. And I think we have somebody here from Wastewater if you have any questions. Yeah. And um, I think probably the greatest value on Monday would be to have a wastewater statement talk about intrusion and the impact that we have on load. Uh, and it would be nice to have that as a part of and parcel of that, which we could say for the for Monday. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner McClellan. Thank you, Mayor. On the purchasing side, <clears throat> can someone remind me, how do we decide when we would go through the cooperative purchasing versus to solicit um, proposals or a specific bid? I'll take a stab at it. I mean, essentially, uh, there's, there, there are local government cooperative purchasing organizations out there that have gone through a selective process, you know, competitive selection process, and, and, and because of their, they're representing multiple jurisdictions, they have better uh, negotiating leverage to get better terms and conditions. 
And so if we, you know, in, in viewing a situation, determine that that's in the best interest of the city, we'll go through a cooperative. And also if there is a, a, that, that is available to us, I mean, obviously that there are plenty of services where that hasn't, uh, you know, the, 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 the cooperative has not, you know, uh, uh, procured anybody. But it's essentially a way for local governments to leverage their, you know, aggregate negotiating you. lever, uh, you know, power. Thank you. It makes sense. Yeah. I was just trying to, it yes. was, as we've had one previously where it was a request for qualifications and this one's the cooperative, just get it, trying to make sense of how we approach, when we have a need, identifying, okay, this it's possible there's a vendor in this cooperative versus um, a need to go out and solicit bids. And given the, you know, the price of this, just making sure we feel confident that the cooperative approach is, is the most competitive if I in recall, this case. I, I think the... Uh, for buy board, uh, the various prices and proposals for all the items that are on there had been competitively bid, and that's how they ended up on that, that cooperative. Makes so, sense. And, and I think your question too is, when are we? When is materiality enough that we might be able to beat the cooperative price? Sure. Yeah. You know, and so maybe there could be some sense of that scope communicated on Monday as well. You know, just what size projects are, you know, cooperatively based. What would it be if we were doing something larger? Just to give a sense, that's that's a good valuation question. Any right, other good. any other points or questions? All right, thank you very much. Next, all right. Next up is uh, this is a memo uh, regarding construction agreement with Felix Associates of Florida. This is for the North Side Pump Station replacement. Uh, the existing pump station was built in the late '80s and is nearing end of life and needs replacement. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest uh, pumps in the city's uh, wastewater uh, utilities, and it, it conveys approximately 2.6 million gallons uh, per day. Uh, the city's purchasing apartment issued an invitation to bid uh, and to procure services for this, and three contractors responded. They were Felix Associates of Florida, Inc., out of Stewart, Florida, c and Contracting Services, LLC, out of Tampa, and Vogel Brothers Building, out of Lakeland. Uh, the difference between uh, and Felix Associates of Florida had the was the lowest responsive responsible bidder at seven million two hundred thirty one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. The difference between Felix and Vogel, which is the local contractor, uh, was one million three hundred five thousand and twenty nine dollars, and this is greater than the criteria for local preference under City of Lakeland Ordinance fifty uh, five thousand eight uh, five fifty eight fifty. Uh, the total not to exceed cost associated with this contract is $7,231,750, and the project has been approved and budgeted in Water Utilities FY 2023 budget. The all work associated will be completed by January 31, 2025, and I believe we have Guy Taylor from uh, Wastewater here to expand on some of the uh, specifics of the deal if you have any questions. Can I have those specifics Monday or now? I don't where is that? Can you, where's that pump station location located? of the pump station? That would be now. <laughs> Guy, Guy Taylor with Water Utilities Engineering. Thanks. The location is are you, uh, along 98 there before you get to Griffin Road where the um, uh, Home Depot is located on the east side of the road. There's uh, some billboards and there's a, a trailer park, the Kings and Queens trailer park. It's in that vicinity there along the east side of 98. The wooded area, right? Uh, it's actually a clear, behind it. It's it's very wooded, okay. but the 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 location of the site where the work where the present station is and the new station will be is cleared off. How do you the transfer of the installation and survive that kind of tonnage? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Tonnage. Well, basically, you build you build the new station in place with all of its supporting equipment, the generator, the MCCs, and everything like that. And then we use a, a, a method referred to as bypass so that you intercept the flows for the existing flow and you put that into the um, pipes that can, that can handle that. And then you move over the new pipes to make the, the connections and everything. There's a, been a detailed plan put together by Chastain Skillman, which already incorporates all these details. Um, so we. It is done seamlessly without interruption to the to the citizens. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So this is part of that little two point acres we just acquired to do this with. Is that part of the same project? Yes. Okay, right. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know. I know there's some acreage there, but I, okay. I I can't speak to the exact one you're referring to. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Hey, thank you very much. Welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. Appreciate it, guy. 
and then the um, third item. The third Maximo I Enterprise. No. Yes, the okay. third item that we have is an agreement with IBM. This is a software subscription and support renewal and, as, and a license upgrade for our existing Maximo Enterprise system. And this is the system that is used citywide by most of our departments. It manages city assets through schedules, resources, processes, and basically it's essentially used to improve our operational performance, extend those asset life cycles, and optimize the maintenance work processes. Uh, typically, uh, we'll see an increase in cost over over this type of um, system about at 10% um, from year to year. But this year, because of the upgrade as well, there's an additional cost. Uh, so the total cost is $602,472. Um, it's a 12-month renewal uh, from which would be effective July 1st through June 30th, 2024. Uh, FY23's budget, most of it is coming from the IT's budget, and then wastewater and water and Lakeland Electric will um, have the remaining portion of the budget uh, for the total in their budget. This does not get us out around on the budget at all. We're sharing the ability to fund it. Correct. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Just one year? It's yes. a one year agreement. Yes. Uh, do we get a better deal for two or we don't get LB2? Okay, so Commissioner, I asked the same question. Uh, typically, you'll see these um, software license agreements year to year, but, but then we try to bundle them multi-year because typically we could get a better, a better pricing. But in this case, I think IT has explained that they're kind of looking at what other options we may have so we don't lock ourselves into this particular agre agreement for multi-year. So in the next year, we're probably looking for that. <clears throat> Excellent. Right, nothing else on that? Then we will go now to the finance director. I was too eager, sir. I apologize. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, we have one appropriation uh, request. In fiscal year 21, the city uh, was awarded $22,726,368 in American Rescue Plan Act funds, or ARPA funds, uh, for specific authorized uses to support the city's response to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, based on these uses, the city has, uh, the commission has previously approved appropriations for uh, totaling $17.8 million for the Western Trunk Wastewater Project, $64,751 for Web EOC, $100,000 for Management Consulting Services, and, and $900,000 for Station 8's fire truck, the, the ordering of that. We are now requesting that the next two projects that were in the Commission's list uh, totaling $1.901 million. A million dollars is for affordable housing, and 901000 is for public safety, uh, for the additional uh, public safety personnel that you authorized hiring. The million dollars for the affordable housing will, be, pro will provide funding for affordable housing development that aligns with Home Investment Partnerships Program, or HOME, uh, uh, for income limits for low or moderate income households. The funds will be made available through the issuance of an RFP seeking appro uh, affordable housing developers for construction of affordable multifamily housing. The funds will be awarded to one or more qualified developers and subject to a development agreement with specific benchmarks. This supports Target Area 3, the city's strategic plan to increase the inventory of affordable rental housing units. The 901,000 for public safety capital costs will provide funding for the uh, vehicles, uh, radios, uh, weapons, um, body cams, ballistic vests associated with the 13 positions that were added to the police department's budget in fiscal year 23. The equipment uh, will be based on overall inventory supply needs. $700,805 will be required for the vehicle purchases and $201,195 for the equipment purchases. Excellent. This is a wonderful um, opportunity to utilize those funds that were uh, allocated, and I'm so grateful that we have this remaining balance to do so uh, in both those ways. Would remind that on the affordable housing side, the million dollars 
that is invested in that has about a six to seven dollar multiplication factor by the time we get all done working with vendors so that makes a huge difference in what we're able to accomplish and then on the public safety side aligns with the things that we know are most important to our citizens to provide that base core of public safety and quality of life that we want to assure commissioner mccarley we have on that wastewater project a contingency uh, well, david's here mr bayhan just after we are looking at other utility issues that we have i just want to make sure that that's enough money for what they well, it's definitely oh, not enough is, money. We, yeah. we knew going in that wasn't going to be enough. Well, no, no. Right. I know that part. Yeah. I just yeah. want to yeah. hear what the contingency is. So, good morning. David Bayhan, uh, Water Utilities. Um, so, the $17.8 million is not nearly enough to cover the whole project. Right. Um, we are working on funding strategies, uh, which includes SRF um, and, and possibly some grants to fund the residual. But um, It's SRF. State Revolving Fund, sorry, uh, FDEP. Um, has a program where we can borrow funds at a very, very low rate for these types of projects. Great question. Sir. That that project, of course, went from an estimate of, I think we were 21, 22 million. Yeah. To now, 30. To over 30. Yeah. Over 30. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yes. And, and we're we're still working on the estimates right now. Right. Thank you. And, and emphasizes something that we have to do, and we don't have any choice to be able to do, so we have to figure out how to do that going forward. That's the fortunate part of it taking a while to get done before we can actually do it because we have to put that in place. Um, and it pivots against the use of those funds that you could allocate, <coughs> allocate. The materiality of what's left in this ARP is not as great as the impact probably these both provide for us in terms of immediate benefits. And that's a weighing against as well. Any, Commissioner Reed. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll he is like you. I'll go, I'll go after him. <laughs> On the affordable housing, uh, $1 million, I don't see Mike Smith, but maybe on Monday if he can just comment on that just from the you know, the timing, uh, any details that he can add to that would be great. To tag on, sorry, the process of that too, how that was going to be pushed okay. out could be interesting. Good idea. That was my question. I was going to ask Brian if he could come up for a moment to... Uh, uh, <laughs> Call on someone else if you don't well, see him. <laughs> I think this is his program. I think this is... Just, from Mike on Monday. <laughs> Good morning. The the, uh, the the million dollars is this for like when people want to fix up their houses? Is no, sir. This is is this for like that we have apartment complexes and give them a TIF and other stuff like that? Correct. Right. This is incentivized sort of gap project funding for the likes of projects like Parker Point, like Ada Palms, uh, like Griffin Lofts that you approved the brownfield for this morning. Um, we've still got Swan Lake Village on Griffin Road that's under construction. Uh, so those types of projects. And as the mayor said, we are a minority player usually on the financing side of those kinds of deals. But it, it's critical funding to help them make the project work. How much did we spend last year on these type projects? Goodness. I have to pull for a specific year the actual spend because we... we we allocate and then we commit and then we spend as a project gets built over a period of years. Um, but you know, each year the CRA, the general fund, our, our home and ship dollars, and now these ARPA dollars, if approved, you know, are, are all sort of cobbled together to use to make these projects a reality. We can get you that number from, from FY22. Have we used all the money we have in there right now? We have not. How much do we have left? You got any idea? <laughs> I'd like to know that too. Yes, sir. We'll get you that number uh, as well. The reason I'm asking, you know, again, we've had some extensive overruns and some projects, and we might, some of this million dollars might be better spent somewhere else. I know affordable housing is a critical component, but I'd like to see if there may be a place to better spend this money. Uh, if we spend a lot of money and we haven't utilized what we have, a uh, million dollars on our bond, if you over the years are going to turn out to be a lot of money but i would like to put that on the discussion any me. any specific areas that you'd like to consider it well not necessarily okay. i've i'm gonna leave it up to mike he's uh he knows better yet where our money could be spent to maybe get a bigger bang for the buck per se uh as opposed to because interest rates are higher we're seeing apartments being built less uh and like i say with inflation our cost is just getting out late and uh, if we could save 
money someplace else, we get a, a maybe a bigger back for a greater amount of citizens as opposed to uh, uh, some other citizens that need help as well. But it's just a thought to uh, we might discuss on Monday. Any other comments? All right. Thank you very much for that report, sir. All right. That brings us Excuse then. Excuse me. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Simmons, I didn't see your hand. It doesn't pertain to the affordable housing. Yes, sir. Uh, but it does pertain to the uh, the uh, ARPA funds. Uh, um, you mentioned that, excuse me, you mentioned that some of those funds would go to uh, police officer positions. Uh, my question is, how does the fact that the that we are bringing back the resource officers uh, from the schools back into the, the main force. How does that affect these these new positions? There, there's two considerations. That that is consideration for personnel and out application of them. These nine hundred thousand dollars are all just for the supporting items. It's for vehicles. It's for ballistics. It's for all the things that make what we've already approved be in place. So you're not. I thought I heard somebody. I thought I thought I heard someone mention that. Oh, I thought it was mentioned that uh, there would be police positions uh, funded by these ARBA funds. Is that not correct? It's, it's the th this nine hundred thousand is related to the thirteen new positions that were added by the commission this year, not related to those those folks that were SROs in the schools. My question is: uh, Is it the salary or is it? Well, no, no. It's, I mean, the positions. If you if you're adding new positions, and you've and you've budgeted positions, and these arbor funds are positions, then the fact that the SROs coming back. I sir, mean, you understand so, what I'm saying? Yes, sir. I believe so. And and I think maybe the easiest way to answer that is that our headcount at the police department is remaining the same. We're not reducing it or increasing it because of the SRO officers. What we're doing is bringing them back to needs that we had otherwise. And so when the commission decided to add those positions, there was also discussions about more positions that would be needed in the future for some of those needs. Well, now this will backfill into some of those needs. So this, okay, yeah. this yeah. could likely lessen the need for as many officers moving forward. Now, you know, we've got to work that through the police department and, of course, with growth and, and other things. I'm not I don't want to represent that there won't eventually be requests for more officers but based on our previous discussions that backfill is helping us with that so we're not you know we're early on still in budget um, uh, development but th that will help uh, delay a request for for more officers it's a follow-up question how many SORs are actually coming back to the uh, the main force I can get that number. Um, yeah, I'll need to get that. I, I don't think we have anybody here from PD, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't have the exact number. All right, thank you. And I think it's important too, and this is just a round out. When um, uh, Chief Garcia did the study, if I recall this correctly, we using national numbers could justify 31 additional people, additional positions, of which we did 13. So. You know that there was this room for what else that would you would need, and some of that's because of efficiency, some of that's because of who we are and what we are as a community. I mean, so that we don't necessarily need 31 per se, uh, comparing to national standards. And so, but there was there's some number in between, and that SRO integration helps to backfill some of the right, right, right. What's that's, above that, was, the that was my uh, this this allocation. Question, though, what would be the impact of their coming back with the, with regard to? Uh, what was budgeted, or what was needed. Thank you. And, and this is an allocation for stuff only, you know, for equipment, not for people. That 900000 So it supports what we already approved in terms of their ability to have vehicles and all the things needed to support it. I don't know how, know how I got confused with that, with the, the support equipment and positions. Somehow I was thinking that I heard positions, but there would be no positions with the ARPA money? That's what you're saying? It's we're, the we're not, it's we're, the, the ARPA monies are not paying for personnel. Okay. They are paying for the equipment associated with those hirings. The general fund is paying for those 13 people, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Right, yeah, you. so basically general fund is paying for salary, and some of the ARPA money is paying for capital related okay. to those positions. That, that's what you'd want to know the difference between. Right. Yeah, okay. Yep. 
Such vehicles, radios, weapons, ballistics, vests, et cetera. All right. <clears throat> Any other questions on that? All right. That is um, it. So what are some things that we uh, would like to share? From commission, yes, commission. So from the legislative standpoint, the governor's veto list was released yesterday. Um, so fortunately for City of Lakeland, um, our seven wetlands project was approved at nine and a half million dollars. Historic preservation got another fifty thousand. The PRWC did get their eight and a half million. I don't know if that was their full request. Unfortunately, on the veto list is our widening of Kathleen Road, which I think Chuck is. Chuck's still here. That's beyond us. You don't have to get up. That's just be outside the city limits. That was in unincorporated Polk. Um, the sixth uh, District Court of Appeals Courthouse P and D study at six million was vetoed. The Polk Museum of Art five hundred thousand was vetoed. Florida Poly and Polk State both had requests in that were vetoed, and then there are a lot of small projects throughout Polk County that were vetoed. So. Lakeland is, is better with the Seven Wetlands Historic Preservation and PRWC obviously is a collective. The Florida Department of Transportation, their 116.5 billion um, was approved. About part of it was um, vetoed, but that includes 4 billion for the Moving Florida Ford request from the governor's office. That originally I think is probably was at 8 billion. So, or six billion, so the legislature still is gonna to have to find that too for the I-4 corridor that the governor had announced, I guess, a couple months ago from SunTrax. So that's just an FYI. I am sure things will shake out a little bit more and you'll see more specifics in the news, but that was released yesterday. Dave Shep and I were texting. I just wanted to confirm I had read through the list yesterday and the only one I missed was Seven Wetlands. I just kept looking for it to make sure it wasn't cut because they only released the vetoes. Um, and then we had a good legislative meeting, which we'll talk about um, on Monday. We'll read the minutes for that. And the other, only other thing I wanted to highlight was that the staff did a great job with the Ridge League of Cities uh, dinner last Thursday night um, that Lakeland hosted. Our team of Carol, Tracy, and Jennifer, they were amazing, as well as everyone else who attended. Um, and we had a really good turnout. So thanks to the team and the staff for doing that. Um, and then also we have, um, I don't think I've announced this, but I'm now from the TPO, been assigned to the Metropolitan Planning Organization that meets over in Orlando. Quarterly um, is the representative from Polk County. So I have a meeting there on June 27th. So that'll be a good learning curve and experience for me to see how that side of the world kind of maps out transportation. Excellent. So that's it. I will round out your legislative issues with one more item. Uh, on Wednesday, Jennifer Kennedy was selected yes. as the speaker for ask. her uh, class. She'll be the first woman speaker of the house in 2930 uh, in Florida's history, which is kind of exciting. Um, the second speaker from Polk County, which the last one was in 1951. So um, uh, exciting on both fronts. 2029. 29 and 30. So, yes. Pending re-election. Those were the pledge uh, cards. Of course. Right. <laughs> right. <All laughs> you yeah. have to survive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she will. <laughs> she will survive. Yes, but I mean, yes, that's correct. And that's, that decision's always done within the class, you know, and it's a battle for positioning in, in terms of that and getting it done and how it perks at the top. And so she did a remarkable job her freshman year in the legislature and it was recognized by her class and constituencies and that's how that choice is made. That gives them time to study the speaker position before they get into that position themselves. And it's a good process because the duration is short. It's eight years, you know. It seems like a long time now it is really not. No, <laughs> you, you recognize it's not. All right. Um, any other comments, Commissioner? Thank you. Reed. Briefly, just uh, for Monday, I would hope Sarah would go this again on Monday, yes. so we could uh, get more people to understand. Thank you very much. Good, Commissioner McLeod. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. But before Oops. you adjourn, no, just, uh, I'm sorry. I want to pester you about the, the, I've the July third meeting one more time. <laughs> okay. I'm still a little unclear. I want to make sure that we're going to perform for that, yes. so we don't have to reschedule. So. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, can I make an original comment here? Sure. There was some interest about moving meetings. I'm, I am, um, I think it's really important for us to talk about if we're going to change dates on meetings, talking about 2024, not 2023. I agree. Uh, uh, and so if we really are thinking we should look at the calendar for some holidays and do some shifting, let's do that looking at the 2024 calendar. I agree with that. Just just because that's a quick turnaround, and I know that and red, white, and kaboom is that Monday as well on the third, which it's always on the third. So um, I kind of 
just personally mitigated my schedule around this year because I did miss the last, I was out of town the last couple of years for Red, White, and Kaboom and wanted to be here for that, but I'm open to discussion. I'm here that day. I don't know other Mondays in July. I don't, if we rescheduled or other days in July, I may or may not be. So I know I'm, part of the I'm problem, a good, a good reason to look a year out is we already have a ZBA meeting scheduled for that Wednesday. So that kind of takes the next day out of, out of play that we would have available. I think Commissioner Music was asking the question, you know, and, and um, as long as we're quorum tight, which we are, then let's just leave this year like it is. But let's take a look at some ho holiday interferences and, that might exist in 2024. Yes, ma'am. And I'd like to look at President's Day, and I've talked to Palmer and Sean about this. I'm typically always gone that day, and for some reason that is, a, I think, a federal holiday, but not a state holiday, correct? And so that's one of those Mondays that it's always, if, if we're looking ahead, we could just look at that um, of that week too. But I know that's not a city holiday per se, um, but it's something I've asked for the last couple of years. And there'd be less people probably that can attend even as constituents because of that to some degree. So maybe, so let's look at that and let's look at a 2024 calendar and some suggestions you make back to us and talk about that at, a, you know, at an agenda study in the future. I mean, what I'm hearing is we do have a quorum. Though. Yeah, your interest is to like. <laughs> yeah, yes. Who's here? Right do you want to know who's here? Like, raise our hands if we're here on July 3rd. Sure. Are you here July 3rd? We're all here. Great. There Thank you go. You. So I just, you know, just just to round out that discussion, I just because I don't want there to be confusion. The discussion was not staff initiated, right. and 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 right. similarly to um, similarly to the idea of future calendars. Yeah, you know, just like some of the holidays that have been mentioned, staff is working that day. And so, you know, the, I think, and Palmer, help me with this if you would, I, I think it's prescribed how holidays are handled if it falls on a, on a commission, um, you know, meeting Monday. So really, I think the question would be then of the commission, right. because I think you would need to probably, do they have to pass a resolution if they're going to amend those dates? Possible, yes. So I, w we can bring that up with the commission at a later date um, to, to try to figure out that from the commis commission's perspective, because staff will be available on those holidays that are not city recognized. So we're asking that for 2024, and you can come back sometime. There's not an urgency in this. Take a look when you can work it in and give us all the scope that we need to know if we make a change. Thank you. Anything else? We are adjourned. Thank you.